speak, becomes a reality? Before we embark on our final trip, have we left an earthly home in a state of chaos or a condition of order? A young minister said that about once a year, he asks his wife, What if I had just died? What would you do? He does not ask her to rehearse grief reactions, but to go through the mechanics of saying whom she would call, where important documents are kept, what arrangements she should make with the executor of their estate. This may not be a very enjoyable exercise, but both the husband and the wife say this mock rehearsal gives them a peace of mind and an openness of communication they did not have before they set their house in order. It has been said that someone found St. Francis working in his garden and asked him, What would you do if you knew that you would die in ten minutes? St. Francis replied, I'd try to finish this row. Most of us are not that ready. We might need ten days instead of ten minutes. I have heard so many stories of people who have spent weeks, sometimes months and years, trying to find documents and straighten out the estate of a deceased member of the family. Then your funeral. Did you make plans for your own wedding? Did you ever have a special party, an anniversary, or birthday celebration where you plan in advance what you would do? Then what's so strange about planning your own funeral? I have preached at many funerals. It seems to me that those loved ones who have some knowledge of the wishes of the deceased move through the funeral process with less anxiety than those who have no idea what the departed one might have wanted. If we plan our own funeral, we should keep in mind family traditions or customs in the part of the country where we live. For instance, in many places, viewing the body is an important part of the grief process which allows the survivors to say farewell to the physical part of the person they loved. However, for some people, the cosmetic attempts upon the deceased are unseemly. It is important to be sensitive to the feelings of others when we make decisions about our own funeral or memorial service. Planning your own funeral is a gift from you to your survivors. No one can convey what you wish to leave as a personal testimony better than you can. Others may extol your virtues and ignore your shortcomings, but only you can tell of your love for the Lord, your appreciation of your family, and your anticipation of heaven, if those are your personal beliefs. Every culture has had its ceremonies for meeting emotional crises. All of the major changes in life, from birth to adolescence, marriage and death, have been dignified by rituals. A funeral should be a ritual which meets the social, emotional, and spiritual needs of the survivors. For believers in Jesus Christ, a Christian funeral reaffirms the blessed hope of eternal life and the resurrection. In John 5.24, we read the words of Jesus, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Polls show that only about one in every five adults has made a will. When we see the problems created for the surviving family members, whenever anyone dies without leaving one, it should convict us with our own sense of responsibility. If you die without a will, the court will distribute your property to your relatives in a manner established by law. However, your property cannot go to friends, charities, or churches if you do not leave a will so stating. There can be no special provisions for heirlooms, jewelry, or the family business. The law gives you many choices if you make a will, but none at all if you don't. A Christian's will may also contain more than directions on how money and possessions are to be dispersed. It can be a lasting memorial to faith in Christ and love for others. Someone said that he could tell better what a man had in his heart by reading his will than by reading his obituary. 
However, the best preparation for death is not a list of instructions about our funeral, not an up-to-date will, but an experience with Christ that gives eternal life. As Paul describes it in Titus 1-2, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. What does await us in eternity? Is it a journey into the unknown? or a glorious spiritual pilgrimage to eagerly anticipate? Man's final destination has been pondered throughout the ages. Some have accepted the tradition of their ancestors. Others have struggled with conflicting ideas. The Christian has a strong hope of heaven because of what Jesus Christ has done through his death and resurrection. Every man and woman who has ever lived will have to answer the question, what right have you to enter heaven? Only one answer will give a person the certain privilege, the joy of entering heaven. Because I have believed in Jesus Christ and accepted Him as my Savior, He is the one sitting at the right hand of God and interceding for me. No one can deny that Christian His entrance into heaven. I am continually asked, What about hell? Or, is there fire in hell? And similar questions. I cannot ignore this unpopular subject, although it makes people uncomfortable and anxious. It is probably the hardest of all Christian teachings to accept. Will a loving God send a man to hell? The answer from Jesus and the teachings of the Bible is clearly, yes. He does not send man willingly, but man condemns himself to eternal hell because in his blindness, stubbornness, egotism, and love of sinful pleasure, he refuses God's way of salvation and the hope of eternal life with him. Suppose a person is sick and goes to a doctor. The doctor diagnoses the problem and prescribes medicine. However, the advice is ignored, and in a few days the person stumbles back into the doctor's office and says, It's your fault that I'm worse. Do something. God has prescribed the remedy for the spiritual sickness of the human race. The solution is personal faith and commitment to Jesus Christ. Yes, there is an alternative to heaven. No matter what your conception of it may be, we know it will be separation from God and all that is holy and good. Every day of our lives, we are just a breath away from eternity. The believer in Jesus Christ has the promises of heaven. What is heaven like? On earth we tend to think of ourselves, but in heaven things will be different. In heaven, God, not man, will be at the center of everything, and His glory will be dominant. Have you ever watched young couples in love communicate without words? People deeply in love find absolute bliss in each other's presence and wished their moments together would go on forever. If those moments could be frozen, with no sense of passing time, would that be heaven for them? I suspect those feelings are a small indication of what it would be like, frozen in time and loving God, enjoying Him forever. When everything on earth seems to be going wrong, and when we ache to cry out, God, where are you? We have the promise that God is in heaven and is in command. It may seem that no one is in charge here, but if that were true, God himself would be a liar. In heaven, there will be no fear. We won't need locks on the doors, bars at the windows, or alarm systems. Everything that causes fear will be eliminated. Finally, in heaven, there will be no more suffering or death. Think of it. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. A little girl was walking with her father in the country. No neon signs, no...